I'll share you that quote with you now. It was from Steven Weinberg, our 2002 Humanist of the Year. <laughs> with or without religion, you would have good people doing good things and evil people doing evil things. But for good people to do evil things, that takes religion. <laughs> When we think about the long war against women, it's disturbing how effective it has been in preventing women from achieving full and equal rights. That couldn't continue without the outdated ideas of religion being used as a prop to support stereotypes and misogyny. That's one reason why it's so important for the non-theist movement as a whole to be standard bearers of those who would be relegated to second-class citizenship by traditional religion. And that's why I'm so pleased that the entire AHA, bolstered by the good work of the Feminist Caucus, are leaders in the renewed efforts to pass the Equal Rights Amendment. I'm simultaneously proud and humbled by the remarkable feminist leadership that I've associated with the AHA over the years, including the likes of Margaret Sanger, Betty Friedan, Gloria Steinem, and many others. We honor that legacy by promoting passage of the ERA as a humanist cause. If, judging by that applause, I think you support that idea, <laughs> please pick up materials on the ERA if you haven't yet already. We're distributing them in the registration area so that you can take action and bring ERA awareness to your communities. Now, I'd like to bring to the stage Dr. Nancy Martin of Palo Alto, California. Nancy has had a career in business leadership and held a number of board positions with organizations doing good humanistic work, like that of the Evolution Institute, which connects evolutionary science to public policy formation and the New Mexico Network for Women in Science and Engineering, which she helped found 25 years ago and is still mentoring young women today. And today she leaves an active, retired life as a grandmother and volunteer. Come on up, Nancy. And I'm just going to put a plug in for one more organization, the Secular Student Alliance. Uh, uh, it's my pleasure today to introduce Carl Kuhn to you, who's going to be the recipient of our, our um, oh, I'm nervous, so let's try that once again, of our Lifetime Achievement Award. Carl is just a delightful person, and the more you talk with him, the more you learn things. You learn about his sense of humor. You learn about the way he connects and interacts with people. You learn about his family, six children, two of whom are here with him today. You learn about his marvelous wife, Jane. Um, both Jane and Carl had diplomatic careers and were ambassadors as their last post. Jane was in Bangladesh and Carl was in Nepal. What a fantastic career to bring the sense of humanism into the embassies of the United States, which let's face it, could use a little humanism. <laughs> and to, to have had that impact at our diplomatic process, I was at a conference that Carl helped found, a, a workshop on failing states, and learned there something that surprised me. There were several previous ambassadors there, and one of them, I think it was Carl, said, ambassadors don't get to make the policy. We have to carry out the policy of the government, and sometimes that's the most frustrating thing we do as ambassadors. And I thought how important it was for organizations like the Humanist Association to be able to affect the policies that ambassadors such as Carl and his wife Jane are having to carry out so that they can be more humane and more in keeping with our principles. Well, if you haven't done it yet, please look at the blog, or I guess it's not really a blog because it's a website, but I think of it as a blog because Carl posts to it periodically. It's called progressivehumanism.com. And many of his writings you'll find there over the past few years since his retirement. In addition to composing music, he's been writing on the blog, and you'll find subjects that include things, I'm gonna read the list, 
power, very interesting subject, the military mind, foreign affairs, one that intrigued me, marital relations, and maybe Jane could tell us about that, um, the Pope, cyberspace, Nepal, the Middle East, natural and man-made disasters, and perhaps one of the subjects he's written most deeply about, and you can find his book out here, on us versus them, and concluding that there really should just be us. This award's been given twice previously, once to Paul Kurtz, whom those of us who knew him remember fondly, that was in 2008, and in 2012 to James Randi. So Carl is following a, a marvelous group of people. He's practiced humanism all of his life in all of his postings around the world. He's the embodiment of a lifelong humanist, and his outstanding life achievements are recognized by this award that we're happy to give you. Please hit Breckham Call. Let's see, can you all hear me? As I look out on this sea of faces, I'm not only awestruck, I am uh, totally impressed but by the changes that have taken place in the humanist movement and in the AHA. Over the limited number of years I've been associated, I haven't been associated with AHA all my life, but I have been with it long enough to appreciate how much things have changed and uh, how much of the change you have done. Back when I first associated with AHA, we humanists were pariahs. I remember that at one of the first conferences I attended, a couple of us got on an elevator with a couple of young ladies associated with something else, some other group. One of them looked at my name tag and said, what's a humanist? My friend said, we don't believe in God, at which point they, they looked like we'd sprouted canines and turned into zombies or something. They looked horrified. They got off at the next stop and fled. <laughs> well, we've come a long way. We still sit pretty far below the salt, but at least we now have a place at the table. It's true that in the last couple of decades, mainstream opinion has become more tolerant and more inclusive. Hispanics and LGBT and other minorities have been battering down doors, and we have profited. Meanwhile, articulate atheists led by our friend Richard Dawkins have led an effective cavalry charge against exposing the more ridiculous claims of the true believers. But it's also true that a favorable wind doesn't do you much good unless you take advantage of it. I give David Diossi full marks for pushing through his idea of an advertising campaign and persuading a rather reluctant board to take the plunge. That broke the mold in more ways than one. It started a sea change in public attitudes. Equally important, it persuaded the likes of us inside the movement that it was time to shift gears. Arguing about separation of church and state was all very well, but it was no longer enough. It was time to start fighting on a much broader front. Roy and Maggie were there. They recruited a great team of young, uh, gung-ho individuals and they, who applied energy and creativity to what had been a pretty sleepy organization. And here we are today. I'm struck not only by the scale of the effort today, 
that by the diversity of approaches, you people seem to have sniffed out openings and opportunities to get our message across that would never have occurred to me. So naturally, I'm impressed. <laughs> but it's not enough. I guess I'm one of those people who was never satisfied with success. I look at AHA as it exists today, and I think it's great. We have hit our stride. We have reached cruising altitude and all that. But now where are we going? It's like what you ask some friend's kid if you want to embarrass him. What do you want to be when you grow up? <laughs> well, what is humanism's role going to be when it grows up? Where do we go from here? <clears throat> now listen carefully, this is the punchline. <laughs> I believe AHA needs to raise its sights and redefine its vision for our humanist movement. That vision should be nothing less than encouraging mainstream America to identify our country as a humanist nation. I think it'll be great when our money is inscribed with e pluribus unum rather than in God we trust. I think it'll be even greater to know that our country has agreed to this and similar changes in our national symbolism, not just because some judge has ordered it, but because the great majority of Americans have come to think that change is just plain right. <clears throat> it may take a couple of generations, but our grandchildren uh, should be able to look back on a past when we considered ourselves a Christian nation and think, well, we've come a long way, haven't we? Uh, sort of like I felt when I first learned of our ancestral practice of burning witches in Massachusetts. <laughs> well, is this impossible? Nothing is these days. Is it improbable? Perhaps. It would have sounded pretty unlikely if someone had predicted back when Obama, Barack Obama was 13 years old that one day he would be president. But it happened. The old Pauls didn't notice it much at the time, but the political climate was changing. Well, the political climate is still changing. The old coalition of forces that insists on defining us as a Christian nation is cracking up. Some fundamentalists are hanging firm, but judging from what Tom uh, Rottenmaker told us yesterday, the evangelist movement is, is fraying around the seams. Meanwhile, uh, the changes may look agonizingly slow from where we sit, but they are unstoppable. It's like a glacier receding when the climate warms up. And actually, climate change is one of the forces causing this massive change of attitudes. Or it will be when the effects become more obvious. There's simply too much going on these days to let people keep on believing in the old revealed truths. Take the biblical origin myth, the Garden of Eden, and all that. We have a better narrative of human origins now, and it isn't a myth, it's based on factual evidence. Our friend Richard, Richard Leakey, who was supposed to be with us to hear us today, is a pioneer in the growing army of paleoanthropologists who have made this narrative not only possible, but plausible. More generally, we now have instant access to all the information there is these days, so it's harder than ever to remain ignorant. You really have to work at it. I would guess that a majority of the Americans who still identify themselves as Christians either already share our science-based views or are suffering cognitive dissonance. They constitute the political and cultural center of our country. And as I said, they are moving our way. Uh, but I need to introduce a bit of a caution or caveat here. 
I don't see almost everyone converting to humanism as an explicit kind of faith, the way almost all Arabs converted to Islam up, up, upwards of 1,500 years ago. But I do and can envision a fairly rapid evolution toward acceptance of the core values of humanism as we know it. As this evolution progresses, humanism can become a desirable label that people and organizations use as part of the way they identify themselves. Mainstream opinion in our society can become humanist, in fact, if not in theory. And who knows, goodies like e pluribus unum will, can fall into place as a matter of course. AHIA, in my opinion, is well placed to facilitate and encourage this trend. Uh, now from vision and theory to operations a bit. It follows that our best long-term strategy should be two-pronged. On the one hand, we want to strengthen the organization itself as measured by such criteria as membership and funding. But the other main task is to get broader public acceptance of humanism as the term of choice to describe the values we all share. We need to broadcast the message that humanism isn't just about denying God. It's about a whole host of positive things about the environment and our relations with each other and about reason and science and about how we educate our kids. Things where most Americans already agree with us. Now I recognize that this is already a part, an integral part of the American Humanist Association strategy. It's what a good bit of the content of our ad campaigns is about, and what Jennifer Barty is doing with the humanist. But I can't stress its importance too much. <clears throat> Expanding our image beyond the old one of a single issue organization is the key to becoming a major player in the current ideological sweepstakes. To the extent we succeed, we establish ourselves as a kind of ideological common ground, a space where many diverse interests can get together and talk to each other. Humanism becomes a bond that, invite, that unites all progressive Americans, not to mention solving an emerging problem with the concept of a Christian nation, uh, as more and more Americans aren't Christian by origin since they come from other traditional faiths. So we should be looking for coalitions at least as much as we seek conversions. Yes, we want our membership to grow, but it is at least as important that tens of millions of Americans come to think of humanism as something compatible with their own belief systems as it is that tens of thousands sign up as AHA members. I suppose most of the mass movements of the past have had to choose at one time or another between ideological purity and the big tent approach. The ones obsessed with doctrine tend to break up over doctrinal disputes. We don't need that in AHA. I'm all for pluralism and the big tent. So let's think big and set our sights on the larger goal of a revolution in how our nation identifies itself but that leads to a second issue, timing. How urgent is the task ahead? How hard do we need to push? After all, most of the factors working for us exist whether we push the process on or not. Some sort of social and ideological evolution is likely to happen anyway over the next century. You might argue that it would be best to let our society evolve naturally rather than forcing the pace and risking bruising confrontations with the religious right that might be avoided if the pace were more relaxed. I take the contrary view. I think that we may not have as much time as we'd like to have. Uh, we can't just sit back and wait for this change. For one thing, climate change is almost upon us. The timing is uncertain, but the first tremors are already here. There's political stability all over the world, compounded by population pressures. Uh, and there are a lot of countries that used to be stable that aren't anymore. 
we, where we used to talk about nation building, now we're worrying about failed, failed states. We don't know whether we can keep the nuclear weapons bottled up or how long. So you'd have to be an even greater optimist than I am to see the planet's future in a rosy glow. On the contrary, I think we can look forward to an increasing cascade of really bad news. I suggest that as the world increasingly shows signs of going to hell in a handbasket, uh, we humanists talk to our neighbors, especially the ones with religious, that are religious with doubts. Ask them, what do you want to do about all these crises? Do you want to just pray for divine intervention, or would you rather get together with people like us who believe our fate is in our own hands and we can and must adapt? The looming disasters we face may range from the serious to the catastrophic. Uh, but there's a silver lining in that they will get people to think more seriously about teaming up with us in that big tent. And there's another development, a big one, that can work in our favor, and that is the information revolution. For the first time in the history and prehistory of our species, every individual everywhere has or can soon have access to everything there is to know. The scientists tell us that each of our brains has billions of neurons blinking back and forth at each other, and that activity produces what we call consciousness. Maybe when a billion or more people start tweeting and twittering at each other, something like a global consciousness will form that will help steer us into more be adaptive behavior. Well, I, I'm getting a little speculative here, and I would ask that you take that last remark as more poetic than scientific. <laughs> but one thing is certain. The current information revolution in all its aspects presents us with a broad set of options for spreading awareness of, human, of the humanist worldview. I know the AH team is already on to this, and I wish them well. In conclusion, Let's not underestimate the importance of the job that lies ahead. <clears throat> it goes beyond making AHA bigger and stronger. The country really is in trouble. Uh, it's like a snake that has outgrown its skin and trying to shed it. We've gotten too big and complicated and diverse to be labeled as a Christian country. <clears throat> And <laughs> humanism fits the emerging need, and let's make it happen. Thank you. Improbable, yes, to quote my earlier thing, but there are cracks occurring all over the place. Uh, if we uh, can see, as uh, Tom showed us yesterday, that some of the more evangelical sects are actually producing modern, some people, younger people that think modern thoughts, even though they're somewhat heretical, who knows, maybe even the Republican Party can do that too. Oh, have I flabbergasted everybody? <laughs> My name is Stephen May from Los Angeles. How do you feel um, that humanists, and in particular the American Humanist Association, should deal with the imminent danger of overpopulation? Well, I don't think anybody's going to do anything 
uh, very effective to deal with the population explosion at this point. Effective, that is, in heading off a population crash that will I see coming in the next 50 to 100 years. Uh, we already have 7 billion people on the planet, and that's straining the Earth's capacity uh, well beyond uh, any comfortable limit. And uh, the demographers figure it'll be 8.5 or 9 billion before too long, before it starts leveling off. Uh, so it isn't a question of avoiding the population explosion, it's a question of living with it. And uh, as I say, I think our best uh, uh, strategy there is to use the pain that it inflicts to convince a lot of doubters that our values and our spirit of cooperation and our faith in humanity as a whole rather than just Catholics or Sunni Muslims or whatever is, is the right answer. Once we have an increasing body of mainstream opinion with us on our core values, we will find that we can do a great deal more uh, to uh, get our country moving in the right direction and rediscover its true purpose, which I think is not world's policeman, but it's world's exemplar. share some of the things that we've talked with everyone here. So obviously we're the American Humanist uh, Association here today and many friends joining us and most of us are Americans. Um, and at the same time, we you have a planetary vision um, and you have a planetary, a planetary vision a, a, that embraces all the world. And I'm, one of the things we're talking about here that perhaps connects the dots with what the previous gentleman was uh, talking about is the role of education. So we know um, uh, that education, of course, is a key vehicle for um, reducing family size. It's a key uh, a piece of uh, uplifting people out of poverty, of dealing with things like global warming. I'm wondering, um, are there particular um, strategies that you see as somebody who's worked around the world in uh, foreign service um, that we would be well to, uh, to use our resources as the American Humanist Association um, to kind of key priorities um, that you would point out in, in reaching from our American uh, location here uh, to connect with others doing work around the world? The whole question of uh, humanism in America and how it relates to the humanist movements elsewhere and, and uh, uh, global developments generally, that's another subject that I've thought about but I haven't thought to uh, bring into an al already rather complicated uh, speech. I, I have written a bit on, uh, on humanism in the world. It seems to me, uh, and that's a sort of a central theme of the book you have out there, that uh, as, when, if, and when uh, most people, most of the people that count, uh, come to see humanity as a whole as the group in which we put our basic faith, then we unleash enormous amounts of power that have been dissipated up until now in, the, in intergroup conflict and strife. We get global cooperation and, uh, and the sky's the limit. Now how do you educate for that? Uh, at this point, you educate by getting yourself in place to roll with the shocks and, and um, say I told you so to the, to the skeptics and, uh, and pick yourself up off your feet with the, with the rest of them and, uh, and uh, uh, adapt, adapt, adapt. Uh, I don't have any particular uh, magic formula for what AHA should be doing to uh, uh, further education as such. I think there's a lot of good thought in this room on that, and i leave it to them. 
Thank you very much for this illuminating talk. Your real gem, not only is what you say worth hearing, but every syllable is a lullable. <laughs> Especially the gray beards like me, who are very appreciative. My question relates to addictive consumerism. Since we are such a commercialized, commodified society, have you any recommendations as to how humanists might help counter addictive consumerism, which is such a burgeoning epidemic? How can humanism help do something about consumerism? Well, uh, <laughs> well, that's a, that, that's a good start. <laughs> now, uh, but, it, but it, it is a serious question, but consumerism is just one of the things that are, that are really wrong with, uh, with our society, and, and uh, when you come right down to it, our, our democracy has gotten somewhat constipated by, by all sorts of special interests that have been uh, getting their, getting up to the head of the table to the exclusion of uh, people who are more interested in the general good. And, uh, and, and there, ha there has to be a trend that, that, uh, re that pushes these special interests back. And that trend will only come with a very large majority if mainstream America becomes united on basic values. At the moment, you look what's go at what's going on in Congress, for example, and you see that a determined minority is blocking sensible actions on a whole number of fronts. Well, if uh, the trends that I was talking about in my formal address, uh, if I've analyzed the situation correctly and we end up 20 years from now with a situation where a great majority of mainstream America agrees on basics, then we can push the remaining fundamentalists off to a reservation somewhere in North Dakota and get on with the job. Carl, this is the last question. Carl, thank you again for your speech. My name is Paul and I'm from uh, Belleville, Illinois. And um, my question, um, I'd like to preface it by saying that, uh, first of all, I appreciate your words. Um, I think uh, what I'd like to address is, is the way that we would like to see the future members of the American Humanist Association engaging in the process politically. Um, because I, I think you would agree that we need to do so uh, on the local level, on the national level, and on the international level. But primarily, I'd like to focus a little bit on the national level in the United States that um, I think the, the problem that we face as American humanists and as atheists is we are the least desirable uh, demographic when it comes to the wide electorate. So we have to face up against being the least liked potential candidates. Uh, how would you see that we can overcome this deficit politically so that we can engage ourselves on a broader spectrum politically to, even, to make changes that need to be made, especially knowing that we have uh, established, well-funded uh, factions like the Koch brothers and Fox News and, and a lot of conservative organizations who really are using their political and financial clout to paint us into a corner uh, politically and socially in the media, the mass media. How would you say we need to engage against that? Well, we need to engage on a broad front. I mean, we need more political numbers. We need more political clout. And uh, I will say one thing about human nature, and humanists are mostly human too. Uh, if, uh, if you get more power, you get more interested in power. Uh, the appetite for power comes with the eating. And we've just got to grow in every possible way, uh, grow more influential, grow more numerous, uh, 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 grow uh, into Hollywood and the arts and the liter literary uh, things. Uh, uh, I, I would like, for example, to see uh, burrowing from inside within some nationwide organizations so that one or more of those organizations, as opposed to individuals, would identify itself publicly as humanist. That would be great. 
Uh, <coughs> that's just one specific example. But my, uh, how do you get individual humanists more interested in political action? Well, the appetite comes with the eating. You get into more of the action and more of us will be getting more interested in it, getting more of an appetite and working harder at it. That's the only best answer I can give. Thank you, Carl. Um, I really appreciate having to share the platform with you after all these years of knowing you and being involved. And it's just terrific what, you're, what you've accomplished and helped us accomplish over the years. Um, next, I'd like to invite up a friend of mine from North Carolina who is going to talk to us a little bit about another way that we could be good without a God. Todd? Todd Steeple. Hi, folks. So what I want to talk to you about today is a quick ask, but not for money. It's for your time. Last year, American Humanist Association and about 20 other groups in the movement joined forces with Foundation Beyond Belief to fight against cancer, in this case specifically leukemia and lymphoma. And in our first year, we raised over $400,000. We broke their all-time record for most money raised in the first year, which, believe me, that got their attention. And we were their fourth largest team overall in the entire country. So uh, this, this is a pretty important feat to them, especially considering we had some other groups we tried to work with which were not interested in working with us as humanists and atheists. And I know that the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society specifically did think first and look at us and had to weigh the options and decided to take a risk and work with us despite potential backlash, which they did get some of internally. And they are absolutely thrilled with the partnership and the results. And the results speak far louder than any of the minority voices that spoke against us. And so we are doing it again. We are getting out there and showing what humanism is all about. And we're doing it in a very public way, out in our communities, doing what we already do, but doing it in a way that we can show our friends and our neighbors that we're just good, ordinary people like they are, and we care about some of the same values. And in this case, it's funding one of the best things in the world, which is scientific research to fight disease. So I would encourage all of you to spend a little bit of your time and join with us. Please join a team. The Light the Night walks take place in the fall, but we are organizing right now, getting people together. So you can go to, the long way would be Foundation Beyond Belief Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, but we abbreviated that to FBB, LLS.org, that's FBBLLS.org. You can go there and join teams. We have teams set up actually at every location in the country right now, but we do need team captains for many of those. And for those that already have team captains, please join and become a member. We'd love to have you on the team out there. Thank you very much. Thanks, Todd. Um, next. I'd like to invite two important leaders to the stage. Stephanie Downs Hughes is a consulting sociologist and United Nations NGO envoy who designs and delivers education and training in peace through justice, conflict management, and win-win negotiation. In addition to her leadership as co-chair of the AHA's Feminist Caucus and in several other endeavors, uh, she serves continuously on the board of directors of the Humanists of West Suburban Chicago, which she helped launch, by the way. Um, Zelda Katuskin is an artist and author who was introduced to humanism by her publishers, Harry Wilson and Adela Amador. She became a partner in the humanist press that they had, Amador Publishers, and took over as editor-in-chief. She remains committed to their mission of promoting peace, equality, respect for all cultures, as well as preservation of the biosphere and she serves as president of the Humanist Society of New Mexico and co-chair of the AHA Feminist Caucus. So I'd like to invite those two to the stage.
Yes. Another stack about for women, short women. <laughs> A particular privilege of co-chairing the Feminist Caucus is the opportunity to conspire in the selection of our humanist heroine and other awardees and having a personal connection to these real world idols of ours. My sister FC Chair Zelda and I are thrilled to bring to you our distinguished crowd and friends a leading feminist commentator and critic, essayist, and poet. So many of us who subscribe to The Nation magazine eagerly look forward to reading every two weeks, in every issue, the astute and pithy commentaries of Katha Pollitt. Under the banner, Subject to Debate, her incisive analyses dependably bring up the social and political situations we should know about and understand in depth. Over four decades, Katha Pollitt has focused on how discrimination and injustice have evolved. She has delved into the complex of both contributing and curative factors associated with racism and sexism, poverty and civil and reproductive rights. Her critical thinking helps us to sort things out so that we may behave knowledgeably and strategically to make things better. Katha Pollitt is a baby boomer, single child born to a Protestant father and a Jewish mother in Brooklyn. Uh, in adulthood, Katha learned that both of her parents had the distinction of being known as communists with a fat FBI <laughs> file to boot. Uh, her father was an attorney who argued that grand juries were unconstitutional because they systematically exclude blacks and women, which the Supreme Court agreed to several decades later. As Katha reveals in a collection of personal essays she titled Learning to Drive and Other Life Stories, her mother protested against segregated restaurants, had had an illegal abortion, and a dream to be a journalist and a fiery revolutionary that was reborn in Katha. Katha attended Radcliffe, graduated with a BA in philosophy in 1972, went on to earn an, F, uh, an MFA in writing from Columbia in 1975. Not surprisingly, a uh, quarter century, century later, she became a signer of the Humanist Manifesto, 2003. Katha Pollitt's first book was one of poems, Antarctic Traveler, for which she received the National Book Critics Circle Award. And uh, U.S. Poet Laureate K. Ryan commented about in the mind-body connection how Katha takes on mortality's darkest themes, finding a human-sized crack of light and squeezing us through with her. Katha's second, third, and fourth books were of essays, collections. They first appeared in The Nation magazine and other journals. Uh, the first of these is called Reasonable Creatures, Essays on Women and Feminism and it makes reference to the line in Mary Wollstonecraft's 1794 treatise, A Vindication of the Rights of Women. I wish to see women, neither heroines nor brutes, but reasonable creatures. I think uh, Katha speaks for all of us today who are gathered here wanting to be reasonable creatures. <laughs> Katha's next essay collection is titled Subject to Debate, appropriately, Sense and Dissense on Women, Politics, and Culture. Here she shows that feminism is not a monolithic force, not a plot, but a growing resistance by women and men against the misogyny, misuse, 
and underutilization of women. The third volume of essays tells more lacerating truths about society, never missing opportunity for wit. And that begins with the title itself, Virginity or Death, and other social and political issues of our time, such as uh, women at work, domestic violence, deadbeat dads, school prayer, on and on. I'm personally so grateful that any of us at any time can tap into Katha Pollitt's wisdom in her regular columns, not only in The Nation magazine, but also via kathapollitt.blogspot.com. Zelda, please. Thank you, Stephanie. Now we ask Katha Pollitt to step up to the stage to receive our heartfelt award initiated by our AHA Feminist Caucus, the Humanist Heroine Award. I guess, okay. I guess I have to tower over you for yes, just you a do. moment. Here, come up here okay. with me. All right. I think we now can I'm do tall. this. <laughs> okay. 2013 marks the 33rd year since you, Katha Pollitt, began contributing to the nation. First editing the book and art section, then in 1995 becoming a regular columnist. Your work has been published in numer numerous other periodicals, including The New Yorker, Harper's, Ms. Magazine, The New York Times, The Atlantic, The New Republic, Glamour, Mother Jones, and The London Review of Books. Prestigious awards you have received include the National Magazine Award in 1992 and in 2003, the National Book Critics Circle Award, and the American Book Lifetime Achievement Award, and you are now about to receive another award. Katha Pollitt, the American Humanist Association, is pleased to recognize you as a humanist heroine. This plaque expresses our esteem for you and your incisive work over four decades. It reads, 2013 Humanist Heroine Award to Katha Pollitt for commitment to humanist and feminist ideals through consistently insightful and inspiring reporting and opinion. Thank you. decades of laboring in the atheistical vineyards. Uh, so thank you so much for this wonderful award and, and for all being here. And um, it's been such a wonderful conference. I've learned so much already. The panel earlier on religious child abuse, that was a real eye opener for me. Um, and I'm just thrilled to be here among so many like-minded, humanistical people. It's just great. Um, I do want to say one thing though, which is I'm not a heroine. You know, I just, I, I won an award, I won another, the Free Thought Heroine Award years ago and I thought, because, and why? Because I said in public that I was an atheist and I'm thinking, gosh, things have come to a pretty pass when just saying you're an atheist gets you a big prize. <laughs> so uh, I've been doing that ever since and, and you see the fruits here today, but uh, <laughs> Uh, I, I, I'm not a heroine. I don't, you know, I don't even get hate mail anymore. That is how out of it. I mean, I, you know, Amanda Marcotte, Greta Christina here today, they get hate mail all the time. They get trolled. They get, you know, people say awful things to them. Um, and that's a big cause in life for some people. But I never hear from these people anymore. Um, so I'm, I'm really out of it. And, and I, I'm just going to have to try a lot harder. So, so. So I'm thinking, who, who, who would I say are some heroines today of, of, um, of, of humanism? And, and I thought of some, and some are women in Afghanistan, 
women in Afghanistan are facing, you know, just unbelievable uh, crises and violence and uh, attacks on their rights uh, that are not just at the state level, but at the family level to, uh, in terms of forced marriage and um, attacks on their, uh, their sexual rights and being put in jail for being raped and all that kind of thing. Those women are heroines and so are the women who are involved in helping them um, and, and starting schools and clinics and trying to get, build a civil society there. Um, and, and some of those people have, have uh, um, had been attacked in very serious ways over there. Um, and other heroines, I would say, over here, abortion providers, yes, abortion providers. Um, <laughs> these women and men, and there are, I think, a little less than 1,800 um, left in the country, and their average age is in the 50s, in their 50s, they're getting older, and so we have to, you know, persuade younger people to step up to the plate, but it isn't easy, um, because it's very hard to be a doctor and practice abortion. It's very hard to stay in the profession and do that. Um, but those women and men deal with threats of multiple kinds, from stalking to arson to sometimes murder or attempted murder, all the time, and yet they go to work every day, sometimes in bulletproof vests, but more often not, um, and, and do uh, work I consider to be life-saving, um, and work that it makes them extremely unpopular in their communities, except among people who need their services. Um, and um, I would say those people are, are real heroes and heroines. Um, and I want to mention one person um, who I know you all know about, which who is Rebecca Witzman of Oklahoma. Um, this, is, this, is, this is a kind of lighthearted, a lighthearted atheistical story that um, Wolf Blitzer goes to Moore, Oklahoma, and um, you know, he's commiserating with everybody. He says, oh, the Lord this and the Lord that. And then he comes to Rebecca Witzman, who I must say for having her entire her house destroyed. She's standing there with her adorable little toddler, a little baby, and who's just, you know, she looks happy, he looks happy. You would never known this disastrous thing had just happened. And Wolf Blitzer said to, says to her, now you must be thanking the Lord, aren't you? And she says, well, actually, I'm an atheist. Uh, and and, and I, the reason I know that many of you know about her is that an Indiegogo, uh, uh, what do you call those things, um, like a Kickstarter, was started for her. Um, and uh, by um, an atheistical comedian, and which has now raised, I just checked today, raised 100, over $100,000 for her, and <laughs> including a $10,000 gift from the American Humanist Association. So, so you all get to congratulate yourself on that. Um, now, I want to tell you just a few things that have been in the news because I know you've been very, very busy, but I do nothing but read the news online all day long. Um, and so here were some things that were a little distressing involving uh, religion, women, the intersection thereof sometimes. Okay, the first is that uh, in Ireland, um, some nuns came out defending the Magdalene laundries, which you probably remember, yeah, uh, there were these, uh, these laundries that under contract with the state and with the church uh, did laundry for, ver for the army, for the priests, all this. And these were women who were sent there, sometimes by their families, sometimes by the government, and sometimes by uh, the, pre the parish priests, for various failings of supposed morality, like being too pretty, um, flirting, um, having a child out of wedlock, that kind of thing. So these nuns are saying, you know, you have to look at it in context. You have to look at it historically. They did a lot of good in those laundry. I'm just thinking there is just no limit to people's willingness to, um, to uh, defend the indefensible. Um, so th those were the nuns. Then Roman Polanski also defends the indefensible when he said uh, that um, the pill has killed romance, but <laughs> the pill, this is Roman, 79 year old Roman Polanski, who is, you know, um, a convicted, convicted um, 
of a lesser crime than rape, but we all know it was rape, um, and has been living abroad ever since. And he says, no, the pill is really terrible. It masculinizes women. And I'm thinking, maybe women need to sort of man up a little bit around Roman <laughs> Polanski. Uh, uh, and then uh, we had, oh, the, OK, the best story was the, that uh, this, there was a news story that came out about um, that now 40% of families either have a, a female, sole female breadwinner or a woman who makes more than her husband. Now, if you looked beyond the headline, you would see that the vast majority of these women are single mothers. They were always making, they were always the single bread, the single breadwinner of their family, so that's not new. And actually the number of wives making more than their husbands is, is only about 15%, I think it was when I did the math very crudely. Nonetheless, this statistic was enough to send many people into a total tizzy. So the Christian conservatives were extremely upset about women as breadwinners. And I want to read you a quote from Christian radio host Brian Fisher. He said, that's the way God set it up. That's the way he designed it. Husbands are to use their stamina and their strength and their brain power. Not that they're smarter than women, I'm not saying that, but God has given them a brain. And the, the purpose for using their mental ability is to provide for their families. Women were designed to focus on making a home for her children and her husband. Okay, but proving that misogyny has a life of its own regardless of religion, red state blogger Eric Erickson, who's just fantastically conservative and is on Fox News all the time, he said on Fox, I'm so used to liberals telling conservatives that they're anti-science. When you look at biology, when you look at the natural world, is, is the, the male is typically in the dominant role the female, it's not the antithesis, or it's not competing, it's a complementary role. And then, the great feminist heroine who says she's not a feminist, Megyn Kelly, replied, what makes you dominant and me submissive? And who died and made you scientist in chief? <laughs> I love that, I love that. Who died and made you scientist in chief? Um, so, uh, I wanna just tell you a, a tiny bit about one very disturbing, story that kind of brings a lot of these things together. And that is the story of Beatrice, who is a woman in El Salvador, a 22-year-old woman who has lupus, hypertension, very serious hypertension, and very serious kidney disease. And she is now between 22 and 24 weeks pregnant with a baby that has no, is anencephalic, who has no brain. And this woman has been trying to get an abortion since she was 12 weeks pregnant. And El Salvador, has the, you can't have a stricter abortion law than they have because there's no abortion permitted for any, any reason, um, including to save the life of the mother. So this has been going on in El Salvador for weeks and weeks and weeks. Uh, the Supreme Court, the, the, uh, the, 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 the Minister of Health said she should be able to have it, and the Supreme Court said, well, well let, let, we have to think about this. So, you know, time's a wasting. They said, we need 15 more days. So finally they gave their ruling, which said no. Um, and I did something I never would have thought I would do, which is I signed a petition to Pope Francis asking him to intervene, you know, to intervene with the very, very conservative and very powerful Salvadoran bishops. And I'm thinking, oh, Kathy, you're signing a petition to the Pope, that's so pathetic, <laughs> you know. But, but I did it. Um, and and uh, now, and it's very interesting, so now the, um, the Minister of Health a woman has said, okay, she can have the, she can have a C-section. It's not an abortion, it's a C-section. And it's like, it's like this angels on the head of a pin thing. Like, it's not as, it, because it sort of resembles a birth, a C-section, sort of, well, it does. Um, then if this, when this anencephalic baby is born and dies, that's not an abortion. It is an abortion. It's exactly the same thing as an abortion. But what they're really saying is you can't have an abortion when it's, raised, when it's safe, when, the, babe, when the, the fertilized egg is a fertilized egg. You have to wait and wait and wait and wait till you can have a C-section um, when you're really, really sick. That's what they kept saying. It's like, well, she's not sick enough yet. Well, wait, she's okay now. Um, and that's exactly what happened with Savita Halavanapar in Ireland, which was the la another case where a woman died because her, her fetus was still, still had a heartbeat and they wouldn't 
perform an abortion to save her life, and she died. So um, I saw today online something I really feel I can get behind uh, on rhrealitycheck.org, which is a very, very good website about reproductive rights that you should all you know, bookmark. And the title isn't, tells you the whole story. It's time to strip Catholic hospitals of their right to provide maternity care. I mean, I'm sure you get a lot of really great medical care in Catholic hospitals, but not when it comes to women's reproductive systems. Um, and they should just not be able to do this. They shouldn't get federal funds for this. Um, and it should, you know, they should uh, not be allowed to put women's life at risk in this way, or indeed any other way. Um, now, I just want to say a few more things. And one is people often wonder why, according to studies, women are more religious than men. Um, and I think that uh, there are two answers to that. And one is that people, uh, what was it, power grows on the appetite it feeds on, or whatever, what, uh, what um, Mr. Kuhn said, that religion, for all its being incredibly sexist, is also an arena of power for women. Um, and it's an arena, as Nietzsche pointed out, where women and slaves get powerful men to, be, to uh, side with them, um, that it asks the strong to be weak. And if you're weak, this is good. That's what you want. Um, and so I think that uh, the reasons often given, which is that women are stupid, women are educated, women are credulous, women don't understand science, really have nothing to do with it. Um, it really is about women's social power in the world and lack thereof. And I do think that if secularism became a truly woman-friendly place throughout uh, all its uh, different manifestations, there would be a lot of women who would be ready to um, make the leap because, like everyone else, they would rather be in a space that respects them as equals than one that says, well, you're sort of inferior, but we're going to be nice to you um, if you follow our rules. Um, and then uh, I want to say one more thing, which is, well, two more things, actually. One is this question that was raised in the question about overpopulation, um, that overpopulation is a function of and I wouldn't call it overpopulation, really, but all over the world, birth rates are falling. Why? Because women are getting educated and women are getting access to birth control. Thanks, for example, <laughs> for example, to American humanist um, uh, Jane Roberts of the 34 million friends of UNFPA, the UN uh, Population Fund, um, and who has done such wonderful work bringing the need for uh, respectful reproductive health care to women, including birth control and abortion, but also safe maternity um, and lowering infant mortality and all that sort of thing. And I think that you find you know, places that used to be immensely, uh, have immensely high birth rates, like Latin America, it, it's just falling uh, very, very fast because as people, women, when women can get out of the house, they want to get out of the house, like everybody else. Um, and the more equality women have, the more gender equality there is, and the more choices and options people have, that is what is going to lead to small families around the world. Um, and I think the early phases of the movement against uh, overpopulation didn't really see women as actors in this story. They, uh, I remember that. Um, George Wald, Nobel Prize winning uh, biologist George Wald, who taught at Harvard when I was there, um, he taught the basic biology course in um, the general education program. Uh, he would put up on the board, womb equals tomb. Oh, thanks a lot, you know. And this was about overpopulation, how it was all women's fault. But so womb equals tomb, but what about, you know, uh, education and um, modern um, access to modern medical care and social power and political power equals not the tomb, uh, <laughs> whatever the opposite of the tomb is. So uh, my one last comment is, uh, here is what I was given today, a little, a little globe um, as a symbol of feminism. And it is the symbol of feminism. Feminism is a global movement. And we all have to help make sure that women all over the world have education, good health care, and freedom. 
and we have to do what Sean Faircloth suggested earlier in his one, the wonderful panel he was on. We have to organize. We have to get out there. We have to contact our, our Congress printers. Um, we, have to, we have to make ourselves as visible as the misogynist religious people do, because they're very busy. We need to be busy, too. Thank you very much. that uh, I forgot there's questions and answers. So if you have a question, just ask away. Um, so you said that uh, what humanism and atheism needs to do to draw more women, uh, because you know more women are religious than men, um, is to make women feel entirely welcome as equals. Um, what are, I realize it's a huge question, you know, but what are some things that you think we could be doing to do that better? Well, I think it would be nice if everybody treated each other very respectfully. I'm sure, I'm, you know, present company has nothing to do with anybody here in this room, but um, I'm sure. But I think it's very important that um, that um, when people open up an organization to new people, they listen to the concerns of those new people. That when a formerly majority male institution opens up to women, it changes a little bit. Um, it, they're, they're women and men see some things a little differently, how to approach people uh, romantically, what counts as a sexist remark as opposed to a flattering remark, who listens to whom, you know, who interrupts whom, uh, what is the makeup of the, spe of the speakers at panels and conferences, all that kind of thing, that you have to consciously think about how to represent uh, being a, uh, multi-sex organization as opposed to a single-sex organization. Um, and that goes, for, that goes for everything. That goes for opening up to more people of color, to people that are LBGTQI, uh, and all the other <laughs> initials. Um, and um, I think that, you know, it's, a, it's an effort. We were talking about that at lunch. It's an effort to change. It's an effort to, to listen to other people and um, to really hear what they're saying. But I think it's something we can all do. Yeah. I'm Rob Gorney from Los Angeles. I want to thank you particularly for this afternoon in which you called attention to some subtleties that are easily ignored uh, but are crucial to understand in order to make a change in our world. I'd like to call attention to an ally that you should know about and perhaps do, in the great American songbook and American musical theater, uh, a wonderful song from South Pacific says, you have to be carefully taught to hate. Right. Another wonderful musical is Bloomer Girl, written in 1944 by Yip Harbor and Harold Arlen, which has a song it was good enough for grandma, but it ain't good enough for us. Oh, I've got to, I've got to look that one up. That sounds great. Uh, she uh, was an exemplar. Uh -huh. And I wondered if you have any idea how we might be able to uh, utilize through our humanist endeavors these kinds of resources uh, in making them uh, more, more of service to the cause we all care about. Well, you raise the question of art in a political movement. Um, and you know, that is a big advantage that um, religious Christians have. They have, you know, they have gospel music, they have um, all kinds of country music, wonderful country music, they have all kinds of all kinds of religious music. Um, and it's really great. And I think if you go to one of those mega churches, it's like a big, it's like a big uh, musical. Um, there's a lot of entertainment there. Um, and I used to joke that there would never be Christian rock, but now there's lots of Christian rock, and there's even, Christi there's even Christian rap music. Um, so I think it would be really great if our, if, if our side um, applied itself a little bit to um, the world of, of music and theater and um, uh, 
poetry, and we're gonna have some slam poetry tonight, so that's, that's a start. Um, and um, because people like to, they like to be entertained, they like to have fun, they like to hear some beautiful music, and it can't all just be lecture, lecture, lecture. Um, so I think you raise a very important point. Yeah. Hi, Katha. Thank Hi. you so much for mentioning 34 million friends of the UN Population Fund, of which I'm co-founder. I just think people should know um, that 200 million women lack access to family planning in the world today, and I think it's basically because of gender inequality. Out of the 200 million pregnancies in the world every year, 20% end in abortion, which is about the figures here in the United States. That's 40 million a year, 20 million of which are unsafe and illegal, causing death and hemorrhages, injuries, and infections, uh, requiring post-abortion care. And that population-wise, uh, 215,000 people are being added to the world's population every day. Uh, that is 78 million people per year. So people, gender inequality is the moral scourge and the moral challenge of the age. And I know the American Humanist Association is right there with, with them. Um, you know, I know Roy was supposed to be doing this, but instead it's me. <laughs> so, um, uh, what? To, um, yeah, just who would like to speak? Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Kat. I really uh, appreciate you being here, and you're one of my heroes too. Um, I'm curious about your uh, your comment that uh, you would not call the problem overpopulation. Carl Kuhn seems to think that we're in the midst of a population explosion. You uh, apparently. I don't know, have some other opinion about it, so I would like to, to clarify what you meant. Well, I didn't exactly say that. What I said was that the, the way to lower the population so that we can preserve our, um, you know, the, the planet and all like that. Well, it's, it's, it is more complicated than overpopulation because a lot of it is the problem of, of uh, overconsumption and of unbalanced consumption. Um, but what I said was that the way to do this was through women's rights. Um, but I want to say another thing about overpopulation. People never talk about this. People are living longer. That's a problem. When people died when they were 35 and 40, you could have 10 children, um, and a few of them would live, and you'd be dead, and you know things just went on. But now people are living to be very old, and I think we're all for that. Uh, <laughs> I think we like that. Uh, so, so, um, uh, but that is that is a piece of it. Um, so I think we have to just put our faith in that when people are able to make the choice to raise one or two children well, and they will survive, and they will be able to get educated and find jobs, that's what they're going to want to do. And that when people are afraid that their children are going to die, when they need to be sure, then they don't have any, uh, when there's no social security system, for example, and you have to have a child who's gonna support you in your old age, that's when people have, and when they can't not have children because they don't have any birth control, um, that's when you get the problem of very large families. And that problem, except I think in Sub-Saharan Africa and a few, pla a few other places, that problem is really um, rapidly diminishing as the world modernizes. Um, so that's all good. Hi, my name is Rosemary Hagen. I'm from Florida, the land of old ladies. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm an old lady. And I would like to ask you about the ERA. My mother and my Aunt Hazel marched for the ERA around 1920 and 1918. And I have been fighting for the ERA until I am near death. And I would like to uh, point out that uh, in my time we had pensions, we had a, a wage that was uh, the same as the men in the many professions, and all of this has vanished, and yet we still fight for the BR ERA and uh, we want petitions signed. Uh, but what is your uh, attitude toward the ERA and how can we uh, get it passed, which is what I want to know.
Well, I wrote a column about the ERA recently, um, and that was uh, where I said maybe it's time to bring it back. Um, and I know there are people right here at my table who are very active in that, and I know that's been a, a cause that the American Human Asso Humanist Association has taken up. I will say just one thing, which is as long as you have almost 30 state legislatures, both houses of which are controlled by very conservative Republicans, and often in those same uh, states, the governor is a conservative Republican too, um, I think that the chances of the, ER, the ERA does have an uphill road to getting, uh, even if you can get rid of the, uh, the time limits, um, it has an uphill road in that. I think it's very important that people start paying attention to state legislatures. You know, we tend to think of politics very much uh, as a national thing. And when the, the Democrats did well in the last election, everybody said, yay! Um, Obama got reelected, and that's all great. But in the, in you know in South Dakota, everything you know, the Republicans are doing great, um, and they didn't lose. The Republicans did not lose a single state, uh, you know, where they had this trifecta, where they have all three, both houses of Congress and the governor. They didn't lose a single one. They're doing very well in the red states. Um, and then you look at a place, a place like New Jersey, Chris Christie. Everybody loves Chris Christie. You know, he's everybody's favorite jolly Republican. He's, he's anti-choice. Um, he's extremely conservative on all kinds of things. But so people need to pay a little more attention to these very downstate, I mean, even below the governorship, to these downstate local races and get a little bit involved in all that. Uh, as in school boards, if you can do that, because that's where the uh, fundamentalist Christians get a lot of their ability to sway what gets taught in schools. And these are not sexy causes and they're big pain in the neck and all like that, but, um, but I think we have to do it. We have to, and we have like, here's a, here's a state senator right here, uh, Jamie Raskin of, of Maryland, um, who shows, <laughs> And I think Jamie shows that one person can really make a difference because the state uh, legislature of Maryland has just uh, abolished the death penalty. Um, and the year before that, they uh, brought in gay marriage. And, um, and I'm, not saying, I'm not saying Jamie did all these things by himself. <laughs> he had help. But one and one and one, you know, makes a lot of people before you know it. So I, I would say the takeaway for anyone who wants the ERA, for anyone who wants uh, to see the schools going back to uh, being more secular um, and fair to everybody is get involved in local and state politics. Very important. We have time for one more question. do is talk to other men. Uh, talk to other men, because not every man feels the way you do. Um, but a lot of men only hear about feminism um, from women in ways they interpret as whiny or hostile, or I guess you're not going to sleep with me after all. <laughs> uh, uh, and I think, I think they need to hear, I think it's a message that they can hear better, those men can hear better from other men, because the way it, that breaks the the sort of like women against men thing that they have deeply planted in their minds. Um, and it also, it makes them feel, well, I can still be a man and I can actually believe in equality for women because here's this guy over here and I like him and he's that way. So I would say, yeah. go forth and proselytize among your <laughs> kind. <laughs> so thank you very much.
announcements to make. First, uh, ter that was terrific. Thank you so much. Um, the Feminist Caucus has arranged for Katha Pollitt to lead a breakout session entitled Journalism Now, and that starts at 5 o'clock, and the location is the Shell Room. And if you haven't visited the Feminist Caucus already, please stop by at their table or pick up information at the Journalism Now session. Also, just an update on the Rebecca Witzmune. Um, we decided maybe a couple days after her announcement that we would support the effort as we could too, because our members said, hey, how can we do this? How can we do this? And so we, we said, uh, we, we got in contact with her and found out that um, it, would, it would be helpful if she got some immediate support. And so we sent a $10,000 payment to her directly and then asked our members via an email from me for some support and um, over the weekend raised over $20,000. <laughs> and um, in our continuing conversation with her, she's decided that she's gonna keep a portion of what's been raised and that the rest she's gonna use to support other victims in a very, very humanistic gesture. 